Okay, I think uh, we can make a start. I'm going to continue today with uh, orientation relationships between crystals and also go into a particular kind of coordinate transformation matrix which allows you to take dot products in any coordinate system. It doesn't have to be just a cubic system, for example. Okay, just to remind you, uh, we have here two different coordinate systems, one identified by the basis vectors A, A1, A2, and A3, and the other one by B1, B2, B3. And we can express the basis vectors of A in terms of the basis vectors of B. And it's convenient to represent these three equations in terms of a coordinate transformation matrix where, you know, if I take B1 and I multiply it by the first column here, then I get this equation, uh, so sorry, A1 is equal to B1 times the first column, so 1, 1, 0. Similarly, bar 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So it's very easy to write down the coordinate transformation matrix if you have a diagram like this, which shows you the relationship between the basis vectors of A and B. But when you do uh, an experiment in the transmission electron microscope, you might be looking at a particular zone, etc., and the angles here may not be so convenient and so forth. So we need to deal with this a bit more generally than the simple diagram that I have over here. And I'm going to focus on the most common orientation relationship between austenite and ferrite which is known as the kerjumov sachs orientation relationship. Some of you might have heard of that. And we'll also go through the orientation relationship between cementite and ferrite, which is known as the Bagaryatsky orientation relationship. Okay, so this is a case where we can simply derive this by inspecting the diagram, but we need to do this a bit more generally. And this is how you might normally start off, that you have an electron diffraction pattern here, and the dashed line here refers to the electron diffraction pattern from austenite, and the continuous line to the electron diffraction pattern from ferrite. And normally, when you are in the trans, uh, doing transmission electron microscopy, if you spot you know, two reflections here which are quite close to each other, then one is likely to be from austenite and the other one is likely to be from ferrite. Okay, so that's a way of identifying which reflection comes from austenite. Now by looking at this uh, pattern, uh, you will see that the zone axes of these two patterns are parallel. Okay, so that gives us one set of vectors that the 111, uh, uh, sorry, the 101 axis of austenite is parallel to the 111 axis of ferrite. And then you look at another set of vectors here, and you see that the 011 type of ferrite is parallel to the 111 of austenite. If you look at that carefully, basically the most closely packed planes are parallel. So the 111 plane of austenite is parallel to the 011 of ferrite. And in those planes, the closed pack directions from the two lattices are parallel. So the 101 direction of austenite, which is the closed pack direction, is exactly parallel to the 111 ferrite, which is the closed pack direction in ferrite. Okay. So that's called the kerjumov sachs orientation relationship. Very, very common in the case of steels, uh, in in copper zinc alloys where you have FCC and BCC and many, many other systems where you have a mixture of FCC and BCC phases. So basically it means that the close back planes are parallel and close back directions within those planes are also parallel. So here is the close back plane of austenite. Okay? So I've removed all the other atoms. This is the 111 plane of austenite and these are the three close back directions within that plane. And similarly, in the body-centered cubic lattice, this is the most closely packed plane. It's not closed packed because we don't have three directions along which the atoms touch, uh, but it's the most densely packed plane in ferrite. And these directions, the 111 directions, are the closed packed directions in ferrite. 
So if I superimpose those two planes, then I'm getting towards the kojimo sachs orientation relationship, and then I rotate the planes so that the close-back directions, that means one of these directions becomes parallel to the body diagonal of ferrite, and that's the kojimo sachs orientation. Okay? So this is just the same planes drawn out uh, a little bit more. So here we have the hexagonal arrangement of atoms on the close back plane of austenite, perfect hexagon. These angles are all 60 degrees, okay? And these are our close back directions, the 110 type directions, which you saw in the previous slide. And this is the 110 type plane of ferrite. And notice that this, hex this is no longer a hexagon because these two directions are the body diagonals that we saw in the previous diagram. Uh, they are of equal length, but this is not. Okay, so this is a kind of a hexagon which is squashed. It's a distorted hexagon. So when I superimpose these two, you will not get perfect fit between the two lattices. Right? Everyone happy with that? Okay, so here we are. Uh, I've got the one on one one plane of austenite, the close back plane, and I'm going to superimpose the ferrite plane so that the close back direction of ferrite is exactly parallel to the close back direction in the, um, oops, okay, so, sorry. That's the close backed plane of austenite, and this is what the ferrite will look like. It's, it's a squashed hexagon, and if I go, actually, you know, they should be superimposing, and they don't seem to be transparent. Let me see if I can change that. Does anybody know how to make this transparent? It's a pity because on my Macintosh, this was transparent. Okay, just imagine in your mind's eye <laughs> that I have superimposed these pictures, and therefore you can see that they don't exactly coincide because this is a, a not a regular hexagon. Okay, so uh, we had these two relationships from the electron diffraction pattern that the 111 plane of austenite is exactly parallel to the zero and one of ferrite, and that the close back direction in this plane is exactly parallel to the close back direction in this. So once you have two sets of vectors which are parallel, it's easy to find the third set simply by taking a cross product of these two. I get one bar two one of austenite and two bar one one of ferrite also being parallel. Okay, so this you simply find as a vector which is at 90 degrees to this and at 90 degrees to this. In other words, a cross product, okay? So you can see that if I do one times minus one, that's minus one, two times zero is zero, and plus one. So minus one plus one, these two are at 90 degrees to each other, okay? So this set is straightforward to find by doing a cross product of the first two. So we now have three sets of vectors which are parallel to each other, exactly parallel to each other. And we've got to derive a coordinate transformation matrix between gamma and x. So later on, if I want to find, okay, the 1, 2, 5 direction of austenite, what is it parallel to in ferrite? I can use that coordinate transformation matrix to do that very, very easily. Right, in order to derive uh, a coordinate transformation matrix, we need to make these parallel signs into equality signs. Okay, so this vector is equal to this vector. So I need to divide each of these by their magnitudes. That would make them equal, right? Because they would be unit vectors parallel. 
Okay, so the magnitude of the 111 vector is A gamma into root 3, the lattice parameter times root 3, right? And the magnitude of the 011 vector is A alpha root 2. So this here becomes 0 kk of ferrite parallel to 111 of austenite. Okay, so these are now equal, not just parallel. If I multiply 0, 1, 1 by k, then these two vectors become equal because this is the ratio of the length of the 1, 1, 1 vector divided by the ratio of the length of the 0, 1, 1 alpha vector. Yeah? Is everyone happy with that? So we've converted the fact that those two vectors are parallel into an equation here now. That 0 kk of alpha is parallel to 1, is equal to 1, 1, 1 of gamma. Okay. How do I change this now? Can you give me an indication? What will be the term on top and what will be the term on bottom? Yep, so this will become A gamma into root 2 and this will become A alpha into root 3. So here we are, uh, A gamma into root 2, A alpha into root 3 and similarly for this one we have root 6 A gamma over root 6 A alpha which is just the ratio of the two lattice parameters and therefore I have three equations here, 0 kk, uh, G bar G, bar G, and bar G, and 2M, bar M, and M. And these are the corresponding vectors in austenite. And they are exactly related by a coordinate transformation matrix which we don't know as yet. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? So stop me if you have a question, okay? Because otherwise I'll assume that you understand absolutely everything I'm saying, right? So we now have three equations here, and this is a three by three matrix. This is a, a single column matrix, a single column matrix, and I've got to derive x, j, y by expressing these equations in matrix notation, okay? So here we are. If I place each one of these column vectors into a matrix 0, k, k, and so on, and this is my coordinate transformation matrix, and I put each one of these as single column vectors inside another 3 by 3 matrix. Then I've got my coordinate transformation matrix between the ferrite and the austenite. How can I, uh, we know this and we know this, how can I isolate this? Yeah, go, go ahead. If I take the inverse of this matrix and I multiply both sides by the inverse, then we've got this, right? So, uh, the kojimo sachs orientation solved. We've got a coordinate transformation matrix and therefore whatever vector you want to find in the austenite that is parallel to another vector in ferrite, you can use that coordinate transformation matrix to do that. Here is a slightly more complicated problem. Okay, so we have here a duplex stainless steel and in duplex stainless steel you can get precipitation of austenite in ferrite. Okay, so it's a very highly alloyed material, contains lots of chromium and it's mostly delta ferrite at high temperatures. Okay? So when it solidifies, it's mostly ferritic, and when it cools, you start to get precipitation of austenite in the ferrite. And because it's so highly alloyed, the delta ferrite never disappears. So you're left with a mixture of delta ferrite here and little crystals of austenite. Uh, so here we have one set of relationships between a crystal of austenite and a crystal of ferrite, and that's a variant of the Kojimo-Sachs orientation. 
And here is another crystal here where we have a different variant of the Kojimo Sachs orientation. So here, for example, we have 111 gamma, but this is actually a different plane of gamma, plane or direction of gamma, right? So there are 24 possible variants of the Kojimo Sachs orientation in a single grain of austenite. I'll prove that later on. Okay? So we've got these two crystals here related to the same grain of austenite, and I want to find the orientation between X and Y. Okay? So that's the problem. Okay, so I do that. I find two coordinate transformation matrices, one relating X and gamma, and the other one relating Y and gamma, here and here, okay? In exactly the same way as we derived the single coordinate transformation matrix for the Kojimo Sachs orientation, I now have two variants. Notice that the numbers in this matrix are identical. Okay, so for example, we have 0.741582, we've got 0.741812, 6666, blah, blah, and same there, and so on. But they are arranged in a different order, right? That means they are in the same uh, austenite grain, but these are two different crystals of ferrite. So I want to find now the relationship between X and Y. How can I do that? Just remember that rule that I explained to you, that if you write an equation using this kind of notation, if two terms are not next to each other, then you're doing something wrong, okay? So I, I want to find, you know, x, x, j, y. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So if I, if I take x, j, uh, gamma, and I multiply it by the inverse of this, which is gamma j y, then I will get x j y. There you go. x j y is this here, multiplied by the inverse, which is gamma j y, because it, look, we are reversing the order of the basis symbols, and that means we are taking the inverse of this matrix. So I can now find the relationship between X and Y simply by manipulating these matrices in the correct way. And if you've done it properly, then like basis symbols always come next to each other. Okay? Right, now, this is a uh, cementite. Uh, it's a, it's a orthorhombic unit cell. And there are lots and lots of iron atoms, I think 12 iron atoms inside the unit cell, and Fe3C, so there will be four carbon atoms inside the unit cell. So these will be our carbon atoms here. And it's autorhombic, so 100 is different from 010, which is different from 001, A, B, and C, lattice parameters. And this is the Bagariaski orientation relationship between the cementite and ferrite. Now, why do we get these orientation relationships which are exactly reproducible, right? So if I, if I go back to the Kojimo Sachs orientation, you know, the, these are two different crystals, X and Y, and yet, you know, we've got numbers in here which are identical. In other words, they are variants of the same orientation relationship with closed back planes parallel and closed back directions within those planes parallel. There must be a really good reason why these orientation relationships form and are reproducible, right? Any ideas why the crystals grow with particular orientation relationships? Why doesn't it just precipitate randomly, you know, that 100 is parallel to 125 and then another crystal has a different orientation with the matrix and so on? Why? Why do we get reproducible orientation relationships? Exactly. So one reason is if you have planes which are almost well matched, then the interfacial energy will be small, right? 
And you know, if you have close back planes which are parallel and close back directions within them which are parallel, then you're likely to get good fit between the two crystals, right? Now, why is interfacial energy important? Why should we want to reduce the interfacial energy? Yeah, because by the time you've seen the crystal, you know, the surface to volume ratio is really very small. So why, why is it important that the interfacial energy has to be very small when we get a transformation in the solid state? Uh, no, if you undercool below the equilibrium temperature, you'll have a driving force, but you're on the right track. What else comes? Uh, supposing you had zero interfacial energy, right? Then you would get phase transformation immediately you went below the equilibrium temperature, right? But you never get that. Why is that? Why do you have to supercool in order to get transformation? Well, we are below the equilibrium temperature, so there's driving force. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, I'm looking for a key word here. Nucleation. Yeah? So, the fact that you have to create interfacial area when a particle is very small, that's a very large cost because the surface to volume ratio is very large. So, nucleation the activation energy for nucleation varies with the cube of the interfacial energy, which means that if you reduce the interfacial energy, then nucleation is more likely. So, when a system is trying to transform, it's possible that many, many orientation relationships are, could form, including random ones. But the ones which are likely to form are the ones which minimize interfacial energy. Okay. So that's one reason why we get reproducible orientation relationships when we get solid state transformations. And the same applies to the precipitation of cementite when we form a bainite or we temper martensite. You know, the interfacial energy is extremely important because the activation energy for nucleation varies with the cube of the interface energy per unit area. So, it doesn't matter whether I look at a cementite particle here or here, they will both have this Bagariatsky orientation. It may be a different variant of the Bagariatsky orientation, but it will be there. It will not form in a random orientation with the matrix, and this is quite a common relationship when you temper martensite or when cementite precipitates in low bainite. That the cube edges here, one zero zero, parallel to uh, uh, close back, uh, not close back, but almost close back plane of ferrite. This is parallel to a close back direction, and these two you can derive by taking a cross product between the first two. So we follow exactly the same procedure as before. We've got uh, parallelisms. We've got to convert them into equalities by working out the magnitudes of these. And remember, the magnitude of this is not the same as the magnitude of this because this is now an orthorhombic unit cell where the lattice parameters are different. Right, so we have these, uh, this information from the electron diffraction pattern that you saw in the last slide. And I work out the magnitude of the 100 theta uh, cementite vector and that's just A and divided by the magnitude of the 0, 1, 1 alpha and I get this and similarly for the other two and I use these factors to convert these parallel relationships into equalities. Here we go. So I've got once again equations like we had before with our three by three coordinate transformation matrix. These are single column matrices 
So I just arrange them into equations like this. I take the inverse of this and multiply it on the other side and I've got my coordinate transformation matrix. This happens to be uh, a very easy to take inverse of. Yeah, it's just one, one, and one. So in other words, the identity matrix, okay? And I take the inverse of that, multiply on both sides, and I've got my coordinate transformation matrix. I can find the relationship between any direction in cementite and any direction in the martensite by doing this. I don't need to think about stereograms or anything. This completely defines the relationship between the two crystals. And the determinant of this uh, would give me the ratio of the volumes of the unit cells of cementite and ferrite. Okay? So once you determine your orientation relationship, you can easily obtain the coordinate transformation matrix and do whatever you want with it. Uh, to examine why this orientation relationship happens, what happens if a dislocation on a 0, 1, 1 plane wants to intersect the cementite? Which plane will it come across? Okay. So do, will, will that dislocation be able to cut that particle or will it have to bore around it? Because if there's no continuity of slip planes in the cementite and ferrite, then it will not be able to cut the cementite particle. Yeah. So it's relevant in all your strengthening mechanisms and dislocation theory, etc. So that's, that's quite a powerful result. Yeah? So remember this when you're doing some uh, transmission electron microscopy. Okay, so that's our coordinate transformation matrix between cementite and ferrite, uh, just by taking that inverse. Now, here is the relationship between the crystals X and Y that we derived for that duplex stainless steel, okay? And it looks like this is a nice, neat uh, matrix, and I can take this fraction out common to turn everything into an integer there, okay? So can you tell me what the sigma value is between these two crystals, the coincident side lattice? Yeah, you know, I've taken a fraction out here to convert everything into an integer, and therefore this is a sigma three relationship between the two crystals, and when they touch each other, one in three of all lattice points will be common to both crystals, okay? So this is actually a twin orientation between the two crystals, right? Now, in order to find the axis of rotation and the angle of rotation relating these two crystals, the axis of rotation must be invariant to this coordinate transformation matrix. In other words, if I take a vector u, I multiply this coordinate transformation matrix by that u, that u will not be changed, okay? Because a rotation axis is invariant, right? So that's the equation that I just described. If I multiply this, by an axis which is the rotation matrix, uh, rotation axis, then it remains in the same direction, right? So I can take this onto the other side and just express this equation as yjx minus the identity matrix here times this must equal zero. So if I take away the identity matrix from this and solve the set of three equations, I will get my unit vector defining the rotation matrix. Okay. Everyone happy so far here? You know, if I take yjx times xu minus xu, okay, then that's exactly the same. yjx times xu minus xu. This is just the identity matrix, okay? Right, so. That was our matrix. If I take away the identity matrix, then two-thirds minus one will give me minus one-third times u1, okay, and so on. So I get a set of three equations which I can solve simultaneously to give me the rotation axis. Yeah. So here, for example, if I take this equation 
and I multiply it by 2 and I add these two up, then this will be minus 2 third plus 2 thirds, so this term vanishes and you'll see that u1 equals u2. And then I can substitute for u1 and prove that u1 equals u2 equals u3. So what's the rotation axis? It's 1, 1, 1. Okay? So we found the rotation axis, which is the 1, 1, 1 direction, common to both crystals. And I now want to find the rotation angle. And in one of the lectures, I told you that if I add the trace here, then that's 1 plus 2 cos theta where theta is the right-handed angle of rotation, okay? So here we are. I gave you the general form of the rotation matrix, and if I take the trace of the matrix, then that's 1 plus 2 cos theta. So in other words, um, the trace of this will be 6 divided by 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. 2 equals 1 plus 2 cos theta. So 1 equals 2 cos theta, and cos theta is a half, so theta is 60 degrees. So the two crystals are related by a rotation of 60 degrees about 1 on 1. Now, 60 degrees about 1 on 1 is not a symmetry operation, because 1 on 1 is a triad, isn't it? And a triad means a rotation of 120 degrees. Okay? So that means that we've got uh, uh, two crystals with a boundary in between. If it was a 120 degree rotation, then we would just end up with the same crystal. Okay. And 60 degree rotation about 1 on 1 is exactly sigma 3. Right. So, I've got these two crystals. Uh, y related to z and y related to x and they are both you can see these elements in the matrix are similar so this is related to this by sigma 3 and this is related to this by sigma 3 as well and what I want to do is I want to find the relationship between z and x so I do the usual thing I write an equation that uh, you know z j y into y j x will give me z j x so if I take the inverse of this, multiply it by this, then I get this matrix here. Now notice, uh, you could immediately tell what kind of an operation this is. What is the sigma value for this matrix? One. What does that mean? It's a symmetry operation. Every lattice point is coincident, right? So actually, these two crystals are identically oriented to y. Okay? If I take the angle of rotation here, then this plus this plus this is equal to 1 plus cos 2 theta, and therefore theta is 90 degrees. Yeah, because 1 is equal to 1 plus cos 2 theta, 2 cos theta. So 2 cos theta is 0, and therefore theta is 90 degrees. So it's a rotation of 90 degrees. And if you work it out, this is a rotation of 90 degrees about 0, 0, 001, the cube edge. And therefore, that's a symmetry operation. And therefore, sigma is 1. Okay? So, you know, when you have all these calculations going on inside your scanning electron microscope to work out the orientations of the crystals and the sigma values and what have you, that is what it's doing inside your computer. All these calculations are being done to find the relationship between adjacent crystals, work out sigma values, and so forth. That is how it is done. Okay, here's a diffraction pattern of those two crystals, Z and X. Okay, so here is one zone, and this is another zone from the second crystal. And this is a 110 type diffraction pattern from both crystals. But obviously the patterns are rotated. Okay? Now you can see that there is, you can clearly see what the rotation is. If I take this axis here and rotate by 180 degrees, I generate the other crystal. Right? 
So here's one of the crystals, the 110 zone of one of the crystals, and this is what the other crystal is, which I generate by a rotation of 180 degrees about this horizontal axis. And when I superimpose them, uh, again, I can't get the transparency on here, which I could get on my Macintosh, but if I superimpose them, they would look like this. And you, you can see that there's 180 degree rotation about here would describe the relationship, okay? This is a 112 direction, in fact. But here's another rotation of 180 degrees about this axis. That would also do it. Or a rotation of 70.52 degrees about this would do it. So I've already identified three axis angle pairs which exactly de describe the relationship between these two crystals. And the problem is that, you know, the angle here was 180 degree about here, about the 112. If I take it through the plane of the board, it's 70 degrees about 110, and those are exactly equivalent operations. Okay. In other words, if I take the matrix describing 180 degrees about 112 multiplied by a symmetry operation, I will get another axis angle pair. And I will get 24 axis angle pairs exactly describing the same orientation. You cannot distinguish because they are all symmetry related. So, the convention is, when you state an axis angle pair, state the one which gives you the smallest angle of rotation, okay? Of course, a coordinate transformation matrix is exactly the same as an axis angle pair, and therefore you will have 24 coordinate transformation matrices which are symmetry related. And just to illustrate that, uh, this is the number of symmetry-related operations you will have. Uh, if you have a dyad, then it will be 1 plus the number of dyads, uh, 2 times the number of triads, 3 times the number of tetrads. So in a cubic system, uh, let me first of all show you why. So if you focus on the diagram here, if I put a pole of the general form on that stereogram, then I will generate three other operations, right? And that's why I have three times the number of tetrads. Yeah? So these are exactly equivalent poles. If I have one, I will automatically have three more, right? Similarly, if I look at the dyad, if I have one here, I will automatically have another one there. And for the triad, uh, if I have that, I will automatically have two more. Okay. So how many triads do we have in a cubic system? We have four body diagonals, right? So that's four times two is eight. We have uh, three um, cube edges, tetrads. So three times three is uh, nine. Nine and eight is 17, <laughs> okay? Uh, 17, then we have this one here, which makes it 18, and then we have six dyads, so 6 and 18 is 24, so there are 24 symmetry-related operations in the cube. So in this case, we are unfortunate that we are working with a cubic system. It gives us 24 possibilities, all right? Of course, if it's orthorhombic, it will be much smaller because there are no four-fold axes, no three-fold axes either and so on. Now, uh, this is a reminder of the Weiss zone rule, uh, which I explained to you applies to any kind of unit cell, right? Whether it's triclinic or cubic. If I have a vector, UVW, which is a direction defined in real space, and I take the dot product with a plane normal, which is a vector defined in reciprocal space, and if that comes out to be zero, then that vector 
uh, UVW will lie in the plane HKL. Okay, so that's the wise zone rule. And the reason why it applies to any coordinate system, uh, we proved by taking that dot product, A times A star, A dot A star will be one, but A dot B star will be zero, and A dot C star will be zero, and therefore we have UH here. And similarly, we have VK, but we don't have VH, and so on. And in doing this dot product, I, I haven't said what A star is. Is it autorhombic? Is it cubic? Is it monoclinic? I haven't specified that. So this is a completely general result. But supposing I wanted to do a dot product between a 1 to 5 direction and a 1 to 5 plane normal, in an autorhombic system, how would I do it? Because I need to define one in real space and one in reciprocal space. So I want to, to, sh I want to show you a very special coordinate transformation matrix which allows you to transform components from real space to reciprocal space. So it's just like the coordinate transformation matrices we've dealt with before, uh, that, but this time we are transforming from real space into reciprocal space. Okay, so that will allow you to do generalized dot products, okay? So here is a vector u. This time it's expressed in real space. And here is the vector u again, but its components are now defined in reciprocal space. So a vector is a vector. It doesn't matter. I can refer it to whatever coordinate system. Uh, so the components are u1 and in this case u1 star. And in order to find the magnitude of u, I want to take u dot u. So I take its components defined in real space, components defined in reciprocal space, and carry out the dot product, and that gives me my magnitude of that vector squared. Okay. But how do I get the components of u in reciprocal space in general? Okay. So to do that, I need a coordinate transformation matrix from real space into reciprocal space. Right, so I need to be able to write an equation like this, where you know I can define the components of a vector in real space or in reciprocal space, however I choose to do it. Right, so we do, we proceed in exactly the same way as before when we had the coordinate transformation matrix, we find the relationship between the basis vectors in real space and in reciprocal space. So at the moment I don't know these components of the special coordinate transformation matrix which is known as the metric tensor. Okay. So here's the relationship between A1, A1 star, A2 star and A3 star where these are the reciprocal lattice basis vectors. Similarly, I can write two other equations. Uh, sorry, before I write two other equations, uh, I can actually solve for G11, G21 very easily. So if I take a dot product with A1 on this side, then A1 dot A1 star. Now, how did I get that? Yeah. A1 dot A1 will be equal to G11 because A1 dot A1 star is 1, right? A1 dot A1 will equal to A1, hang on, what, what's A1 dot A2 star is 0? How did I get this? I know, I know, sorry. I take a dot product now with A2 on both sides, so A1 dot A2 will give me G21 is equal to A1 dot A2 because these terms will be zero. Yeah? And then I take A1 dot A3 and that gives me G31. Okay, so we've got the components of the metric tensor <coughs> in terms of your vectors in real space. And I can do that for the other two sets and I obtain my metric tensor in terms of the basis vectors in real space. Okay. So this would now allow me to transform you know, any 
vector in real space into reciprocal space or vice versa if I take the inverse of this. Yeah. Is everyone happy with what I've done here? I've taken successive dot products of this equation with A1, then with A2, and then with A3. If I take it with A1, then only this term survives because the dot product of A1 with A2 star is zero and the dot product between A1 and A3 star is zero. Then I take the dot product with A2, this disappears, this disappears, and I'm left with this. And I can write an equation for A2 in a similar way and derive these as the other components of the metric tensor. Now for a cubic system, what's A1 dot A1? just the magnitude squared, isn't it? Because it's the magnitude of A1 times the magnitude of A1 times cos of the angle between them, which is 1. Yeah. And similarly, this one will be A1. What will be, what will this be? A1 dot A2? 0, because they are at 90 degrees. And this will be 0 as well. So this will be A1 squared, this will be A2 squared, and this will be A3 squared, and everything else is zero. Here you are. Uh, this is now for an orthorhombic crystal, okay, where the angles are still 90 degrees. So any dot product between A1, A2, or A1, A3 will be zero, and these terms will be A squared, B squared, C squared. If I take the inverse of this matrix, I can transform components from real space into reciprocal space, so it will be A uh, to the minus 2, B to the minus 2, and C to the minus 2. And it's extremely useful because, look, this 1-1 one, one direction is no longer parallel to the 1-1 one, one, um, plane normal. So you can find the angle between the plane normal and the direction by using these ma metric tensors. Um, and you can do many, many other operations. Right. Here are the seven different metric tensors which will allow you to manipulate directions and plane normals in any crystal system. Okay. Find the magnitudes of vectors. Yeah. For example, uh, if you want to know the spacing between planes, then that's the magnitude of a reciprocal lattice vector. Yeah. So you just take a dot product between the vector and itself in reciprocal space and you'll get one upon the spacing. You don't need complicated equations to work it out or complicated geometry. This completely defines everything you need to calculate about the unit cell. The spacings of planes, the angles between directions, the angle between direction and a plane normal, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Right, so we've finished orientation relationships and we've done a very special orientation relationship which is the relation between the reciprocal unit cell and the real space unit cell, which allows you to do any kind of geometry that you want for any kind of unit cell. Okay. So this is quite, quite powerful. You know, what you've learned is quite powerful. And even if you don't actually use it, you will understand what you're doing when you use information from things like EBSD patterns and transmission electron microscopy and so forth. Okay. Okay. Thank you.